Hello again, Econ 160. This is Professor Kung here, coming to you with another video lecture. As I record this, it's April 3rd, 2020, and the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in the U.S. has risen to over 250,000. It was just about 145,000 just three days ago, so I'm hoping and praying for your health. Please stay safe and practice responsible hygiene and social distancing. The topic for today's lecture is monopolistic competition. The motivating observation for today is that most markets don't seem to be well described by either perfect competition or monopoly, right? The two market structures that we've studied so far. In most markets, products aren't exactly identical, so that doesn't quite fit the assumption of perfect competition. And in most markets, there's a lot more than just one seller, so that doesn't fit the assumptions of monopoly either. Much more common is a market that has many sellers, but in which each seller has a slightly different product with its own unique characteristics. So the questions we might ask ourselves are, first, what does competition look like when products are similar but not exactly identical? Second, how do outcomes in these markets differ from either perfect competition or monopoly? And finally, one thing we notice is that firms spend a lot of money on advertising as a way to tell consumers about their products and their products' unique features. So what is the role of advertising, and does it serve any purpose other than manipulating people's preferences on what to buy? The picture on the right here is of the mathematical statistician and economist Harold Hotelling, who developed a lot of the underlying theory that we'll be studying today. So when there's a market with many buyers and many sellers, but products aren't exactly identical, and each supplier's product has its own unique characteristics, we call that market structure monopolistic competition. It's called monopolistic competition because the firms are in one sense monopolies, and in another sense they're competitors. They're monopolies in the sense that they each control the price and quantity of their own unique product. But they're competitors in the sense that the firm's control is limited because if a firm wants to raise its price too high, it'll soon find that its customers are switching to an alternate product. Monopolistically competitive markets are also sometimes called differentiated products markets. Uh, just in case you ever hear that term, you should know that they mean basically the same thing. Okay, so let's think of some examples for monopolistic competition. Can you think of any on your own? I'm pretty sure that you can. So how about something like manufactured products like breakfast cereal, cars, or even clothing? Right, these are all products that have a lot of different suppliers. Uh, but each product is also somewhat different. Or how about service sector industries like restaurants or retail stores or even higher education? Again, these are all industries that have many suppliers, but they're each offering something a bit different. And finally, of course, we have the market for movies, music, books, and games, and basically other cultural products as well. In these markets, differentiation is especially important as consumers' tastes can vary quite widely. So based on these examples, I hope you can already see that monopolistic competition is the most common type of market structure among those that we've discussed so far, and thus it's the most realistic model of competition for most markets. How does monopolistic competition differ from perfect competition and monopolies? So the main difference from perfect competition is that the firms are not price takers. Because they have a unique product that no other firm is selling, they can control the price of that product. But of course, just as with a monopolist, they still have to obey the demand curve. And the main difference from monopolies is that a monopolistic competitor faces competition from other firms. In practice, this means that their demand curve is going to be affected when other firms enter or exit the market. And we're going to see how that plays out in just a couple of slides. But first, let's see how a monopolistic competitor will maximize its profits. As it turns out, the mechanics for how a monopolistic competitor maximizes profits is exactly the same as how a monopolist maximizes profits. They're going to choose the quantity for which marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And so in this diagram, profit is maximized at this quantity, and this would be the profit maximizing price, and the rectangle here is the profit. So it looks exactly the same as with a monopolist. And there's even some deadweight loss, which is given by this triangle, just like with a monopolist. 
So if profit maximization is the same as with monopolies, then what's the difference between monopolistic competitors and monopolies? The main difference is how the presence of other firms affects the demand curve of a monopolistic competitor. So for example, if a competitor enters the market, that's going to draw some customers away from you and towards the new competitor, right? So think of how Apple dominated the smartphone market with its iPhone until the entrance of the Samsung Galaxy. So when a competing firm enters, the demand curve of your firm is going to shift downwards like this. And if the competing firm is entering with a product that is very similar to yours, your demand curve might even become more elastic like this. And it becomes more elastic because when there's a very close substitute to you in the market, it becomes easier for consumers to switch away from your product and towards an alternative product. And so you don't have as much power to raise prices on them uh, as you did before. Okay, so now if a competitor exits the market, then that's going to draw customers back to you, right? And so basically all the customers for whom you are the second best choice of compared to the guy that just exited are going to come to you now. And so when a competitor exits the market, your demand curve is going to go up like this. And in fact, if the competitor that exited was very similar to you, then your demand curve might even become less elastic like this. So in summary, the main difference between a monopolistic competitor and a monopolist is that the entry and exit of other firms is going to affect your demand curve. So Harold Hotelling developed a nice little model to illustrate all of this called Hotelling Beach. And this is how the story goes. We have a long beach that runs from east to west, and there are lots of people all along the beach, and they're hungry for ice cream. So to serve their demand for ice cream, an ice cream cart comes along. Since it's the only ice cream cart on the beach, it's basically a monopolist, and everyone who wants ice cream is forced to buy from this cart. But sensing the opportunity for profit, another ice cream cart comes along and sets up shop on the other side of the beach. Now, some of the people who used to go to ice cream cart A are now going to ice cream cart B because it's closer. So the demand curve for cart A falls because of the entry of cart B. Now, Hotelling's Beach is kind of a silly example, but it's actually a metaphor for what's called the product space, which is a fancy way of saying the representation of the characteristics of different products on a line. So in Hotelling's Beach, the main characteristic that mattered is the location of the ice cream cart, and whether it's closer to the west end of the beach or to the east end. And the location matters because it determines which consumers will want to go to it. But we can think of the product space with other characteristics as well. So for example, in the market for personal computers, we can represent the products on a line with the defining characteristic being whether it's more oriented towards use for consumers, so maybe for playing games, browsing the internet, or watching videos, or for use by businesses, so for running productivity software or other things. And the competitors that are more consumer oriented, like maybe the Mac, are on the left of this line, and the competitors that are more business oriented, like Windows PCs, are on the right of this line. By the way, does anyone recognize these two guys? Uh, they're from a pretty funny line of commercials for the Mac that ran from 2006 to 2009. Here's a brief clip. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC. You know, we use a lot of the same kinds of programs. Yeah, like Microsoft Office. But uh, we retain a lot of what makes us us. But you should see what this guy can do with a spreadsheet. It's insane. <laughs> oh, shucks. Yeah, and he knows that I'm better at life stuff, like music, pictures, movies, stuff like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What, what exactly do you mean by better? By better, I mean... Making a website or photo book is easy for me, and for you, it's not. Oh, oh that kind of better. Yeah. I, I was thinking of the other kind. What other kind? So did that commercial make you want to go out and buy a Mac? Personally, I think the Mac guy is kind of a douche. Anyway, products don't have to be just represented by a line. They can be represented in two-dimensional space as well. So for examples... Cars might be differentiated by the quality of their build and their components, so whether they're luxury or economy cars, as well as their purpose, so whether they're for sport or for utility. And different products line up in different points on this space. Uh, the Mazda Miata is on the economy end of sports cars, while the Porsche 911 is on the luxury end of sports cars. As for utility vehicles, the Honda Odyssey would be on the economy end of utility vehicle, 
and the Range Rover could be on the luxurious end. And of course, uh, when we're talking about real products that are even more complicated, we can represent all of their characteristics on an n-dimensional space. Now let's talk about monopolistic competition in the long run. In the short run, as with any market, firms can be making either positive or negative profits. But if there are positive profits to be made, then other firms are going to want to enter the market. Uh, but if firms are currently making losses, then some of the incumbent firms are going to want to exit. And so in the long run, firms are going to enter until all profits are competed away, or if they're currently making losses, some firms are going to exit until the remaining firms are breaking even. So in the long run equilibrium, when there's no more entry or exit, firms will be making zero economic profit, just like in perfect competition. So let's illustrate this with two examples. Suppose a firm's demand curve is like this, then the profit maximizing quantity is here, and here is the profit. All right, so this firm is making positive profit. But if it's making positive profit, then that means there's space for some competitor to enter with a similar product and compete some of that profit away. So after a couple of firms enter, the demand curve goes down a bit, and the new profits are here, a bit lower than before. Still, there's still some profit to be had here, and so firms continue to enter all the way until the demand curve goes down to over here. And if you look at profits now, they are zero, right? And so now no more firms are going to want to enter. Okay, so let's do another example. Uh, but this time the demand curve is going to be initially like this, and the profit maximizing quantity is here, and so the profit is this, right? Um, but in this case, it's a negative profit, right? It's a loss because the ATC is higher than the price, okay? And since it's making negative profits, this firm is planning to exit. Uh, but suppose that before it can exit, some other firms like it are also making losses, okay? And then somehow they exit first. Then what happens is this firm's demand curve is going to be pushed up, right, as its competitors exit, uh, and the losses get a little smaller. Uh, and let's assume there are a couple of more exits, right, until the demand curve goes up to here. And now this incumbent firm is making zero profits, right? And so the firm no longer wants to exit, and it's in long-run equilibrium now. So this graph here shows a monopolistic competitor that is in long-run equilibrium, meaning it's making zero economic profits. So a few things to point out. First, the firm is making zero economic profit, just like in perfect competition. But since profit is positive whenever price is above ATC and negative whenever price is below ATC, then that means that in the long run equilibrium, the demand curve has to be just touching the ATC curve like this, right? And so that's how you'll recognize when a monopolistic competitor is in long run equilibrium equilibrium if the demand curve is just tangent to the ATC curve, right? And tangent is just a fancy way of saying that the slope of the two curves are the same and they're just barely kissing at a single point, all right? And the other thing to note is that even though economic profits are zero, total surplus isn't actually being maximized, right? The total surplus maximizing quantity is actually here where the demand curve intersects the marginal cost curve which means there's deadweight loss, and deadweight loss is given by this triangle over here. So this brings us to the normative implications of monopolistic competition for society. Like perfect competition, monopolistic competition is going to drive firms' economic profits to zero, but unlike perfect competition, this doesn't necessarily mean that total surplus is going to be maximized. And that means that not all beneficial gains from trade are going to happen. Does this mean that government should regulate monopolistic competitors? In practice, the deadweight loss from monopolistic competition is going to be much less than from a pure monopolist, uh, because due to the competition, each firm actually has much more limited power to charge inefficiently high prices. So although our theory tells us that monopolistic competitors will choose inefficiently low quantities, and inefficiently high prices, uh, in practice, the markup over marginal cost for a monopolistic competitor is going to be much more limited compared to that of a pure monopoly. And so the potential gains from government involvement are also going to be more limited. And because of that, we don't tend to see government as involved in the regulation of monopolistic competitors as they are for monopolies. 
All right, so I want to end the lecture with a discussion on advertising. In differentiated product markets, advertising is an important tool for firms to tell consumers about the unique features of their products. According to Statista, $227 billion was spent on advertising in the U.S. in 2019. For some context, $227 billion is about what U.S. households spend on electricity each year. So it's not the largest sector, but it is very significant. So the question is, what role does advertising play in these markets? Does it serve a useful societal function, or is it ultimately just wasteful? There are three views of advertising, not necessarily exhaustive, that I wanted to discuss. First, the view that advertising is wasteful. Second, that ad advertising is useful by helping buyers find the right products that are for them. And third, that advertising is useful because it informs buyers about quality. So the first view of advertising is that advertising is wasteful. Critics of advertising would argue that most advertising isn't actually informational, but rather it's designed to manipulate a psychological response out of people to buy things that they might not otherwise want or need. A good example might be your standard Coke commercial, which doesn't actually say much about Coke itself, but just features attractive celebrities drinking Coke in exotic situations. Another critique is that it makes markets less competitive. By fostering brand loyalty and creating the perception that products are more different than they actually are, uh, ads can actually make firms' demand curves more inelastic, which gives them more power to charge higher markups. It could also make the fixed cost of entry higher if startups need expensive marketing campaigns in order to compete. Finally, here's an example of why advertising can be a net waste, uh, even if it might benefit firms individually. So suppose advertising has no real value other than manipulating people's psychology, but it does help one firm get an advantage over another. Now, if both firms choose not to advertise, let's assume they split the market 50-50. But if one firm advertises, then that one firm, let's say, captures the whole market and the other firm loses everything. So neither firm can afford not to advertise. But let's say if they both advertise, then the advertising cancels each other out and they end up splitting the market 50-50 again. Right? And since advertising doesn't actually do anything but manipulate tastes, nothing was really gained by the consumers, right? But what ends, ends up happening is that the firms end up using a large number of man hours, creating these expensive advertising campaigns, and these man hours could have went towards creating something of more real value, right? So this example illustrates how something can be a net social loss, despite being individually rational for each firm to do. A second view of advertising is that it serves an important societal function, and that's to match the right buyers with the right sellers. You know, time and time again, I'm surprised by the number of awesome products that are out there that I just didn't know about. So if those companies whose products I turned out to like so much had advertised in a way that would have reached me, it would have made both me and the company better off. And so this suboptimal allocation of resources caused by lack of information is what economists call search and matching frictions, or sometimes information frictions. To illustrate, let's return to Hotelling's Beach. What happens when there are information frictions? Well, some consumers might not be aware of the best options for them. So some consumers who are closer to cart A might end up going to cart B, and some consumers who are closer to cart B might end up going to cart A. This is a suboptimal allocation of resources because these consumers would have been better off going to carts A and carts B respectively because they're closer. But now suppose the carts decide to advertise by flying planes with banners across the skies. Now everyone on the beach knows about both carts, and so they can choose to go to the ones that are closest to them. No more wasted time. Yay! So this view of advertising says that it serves an important societal function by reducing information frictions. Finally, our third view of advertising is that it's used by consumers as a signal for quality. Now, when I say that, I don't mean that the ads themselves are necessarily informative about quality, right? Every ad tends to play up the product's quality, and it's hard to tell which products are the best simply by the content of the ads themselves. So when I say advertising is a signal of quality, 
I mean that consumers can reasonably infer that companies that spend more on advertising probably also have better products. So let's take a look at why. Uh, suppose there are two companies, one with a low quality product and one with a high quality product. They can each choose to advertise or they can choose to not advertise. If the low quality firm advertises, it gains a temporary boost to demand from the advertising, but after a while, people find out that its products aren't very good, and so demand goes back down in the long run. If they don't advertise, then demand stays at what it was. So for the low quality firm, let's assume that it's not worth it for them to advertise. Now for the high quality firm, if it advertises, then demand goes up in the short run due to the ads, but then demand stays elevated because people find out that the product is actually good and they keep using the product. On the other hand, if they don't advertise, they won't get this boost in demand. So we'll assume that for the high quality firm, it decides that advertising is ultimately worth it. So now we see an example where the firm spending on advertising is going to be different based on their quality. And so a consumer who is thinking through these things is going to come to the conclusion that yes, the firm that spends more on advertising must also have more confidence in their product, and so their product is likely going to be of higher quality. But do consumers really think in such a strategic manner? Probably not, uh, but the interesting thing is that it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If firms with better quality do, on average, spend more on advertising, then consumers who get influenced by that advertising to buy their products are on average going to be rewarded with higher quality products, whether they were consciously making that strategic decision or not. And over time, people might start to associate more expensive advertising with higher quality products. And the kicker here is that the content of the ad might not even matter, only how much was spent on it. And so this view of advertising says that its function is to signal higher quality products, and simply by showing that the firm is more confident in the product, and over time, consumers may learn to associate high quality advertising with higher quality products. All right, so let me wrap up with the key takeaways for this lecture. First, monopolistic competition is what we call markets where firms have similar but not identical products. It's the most common type of market structure, so make sure you learn it well. Second, monopolistic competitors are not price takers. They're like monopolists in the sense that they can choose whatever price and quantity they want to sell, as long as it still obeys the demand curve. Third, unlike monopolists, monopolistic competitors face the threat of entry and exit. In the long run equilibrium, profits would get competed away to zero, and firms will be making zero economic profits. And remember, when we say zero profit, we mean economic profit, not accounting profit. So the amount of money profit that firms are making should be equal to their opportunity cost. Finally, advertising is a way for monopolistic competitors to tell consumers about their products. There are multiple views on the role of advertising in society, and all three likely have some elements of truth. Economists mostly agree, however, that advertising does serve a useful role in reducing information frictions, and perhaps even as a signal of quality. So most economists don't believe that advertising needs to be significantly regulated. Okay, so that's it for today's lecture. Uh, our next lecture is going to be on the subject of oligopolies, which are markets that are controlled by just a handful of firms. So not quite a monopoly, which has only one firm, and not quite monopolistic competition either, which has lots of firms. Um, I hope that wherever you are, that you're doing well. I hope that your family and your loved ones are staying safe and healthy from the coronavirus. And I look forward to talking to you again soon. Bye-bye.